Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Social Determinants of Health Academy. This is Shereen Higgins again with the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership. In just a moment, I will turn the presentation over to our panelists today. We have a large number of participants on the webinar, so as always, everybody is muted to avoid any background noise. You are free to ask any questions or send any comments in the question and answer panel on your screen, and those will come directly to me. If it's technical assistance related, I will go ahead and do the best of my ability to make sure that everything is running smoothly. And if it's a content question, we will have a designated Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Next slide. And these are just our SDOH goals and objectives. Um, those of you that have joined us for other sessions, this is our fifth session in a series of six. So you've seen these before, and these are available on our website as well. Next slide. And these are a list of all of the national cooperative agreements that are funded through HRSA that have joined us for the SDOH Academy this year. A PDF of the slides is going to be available um, in your handout panel section. If you can see that um, listed on the side of your screen, you can download the presentation in its entirety and follow along and have that for your reference. And just to let you know, again, these sessions are always recorded and they'll be emailed to you after everything wraps. Next slide. And today's topic is population-specific approaches to social determinants of health. We have a great panel of four different organizations. We have Migrant Clinicians Network, the National Center for Health and Public Housing, the National LGBT Health Education Center, and the Harvard School of Dental Medicine Equitable Care for the Elders Program. Each of the panelists will introduce themselves at the beginning of their content, and you can ask any questions again in your uh, question and answer panel, and we'll get to those at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Jillian, over at the Migrant Clinicians Network. Jillian? Hi there. Hi, everybody. Um, and thanks for joining with us uh, today. I am going to be talking about uh, addressing mobility as a social determinant of health and diabetes care, um, really looking at it a little bit broader, but looking at some specific issues around diabetes in particular. So you can go to the next slide. Um, I am with the Migrant Clinicians Network, and I am the Director of Education and Communication for the organization, which uh, we are, our, our mission statement is to be a force for health justice for the mobile poor, and we provide training and technical assistance, um, as well as another, a number of uh, program areas in uh, primarily primary care, but also looking at occupational environmental health, as well as um, continuity of care and other um, other sort of key topic areas. Next slide. We currently are an organization with over 10,000 constituents. We started as a grassroots organization that was founded by clinicians who were working um, at that point with farm workers, and um, they met together at a conference and really found that they needed a, a network and a way to provide support and resources to one another. So that's how it started many years ago, and we have grown since then to really look at mobile populations in general, not just farm workers, but um, look at mobility as, as a um, major issue in healthcare, as we'll talk about. So next slide. So, um, and if you could just click on that one, it'll start some animation. Um, we have traditionally thought about mobility as this sort of um, south to north phenomenon um, with people migrating, sort of in recent years, right, this notion of people migrating from less developed countries in the south to more developed countries in the north. But in reality, um, and, you know, current news stories really bear this out, if you go to the next slide, we um, Mobility is much more complex, and that that we are increasingly a very globalized and mobile um, sort of human human sub we're, as humans we are moving quite a bit, um, and it's not just north to south it's it's back and forth it's across and it's um, it's complex. Next slide. Um, so, and if there's some animation in here, you can just go ahead and click through it. So the recent story of migration that we talk about um, is that there is a growing world economy, there's globalization, improved transportation and communication, 
Um, that includes the rapid dissemination of information, ease of movement, and increasing social inequality. So all of these things factor into why people are on the move. You can go to the next slide. Um, I actually switched these around by mistake, but so we'll see here. But the main point being, and you can go through the animation here, that um, there is that migration mobility is increasing, and so you know that factors into what we see in the United States, although there have been recent restrictions, um, or sort of increasing restrictions being placed on international migration to the United States, there is still a lot of international migration, and then there's also internal migration within our country. But internationally, um, it's, a, it's a large number of people who are really on the move um, for a variety of reasons, whether it be um, a search for uh, better economic circumstances, whether they're fleeing, uh, you know, war or famine, danger in their home country, um, whether they're looking for reunification, there's a number of different reasons. And you can go to the next slide, which actually was supposed to be the one before this, which was looking at least at the growth in the number of people born outside their country of birth. And then if you can go to the next slide, um, so we're looking now at the International Organization for Migration estimates there are 250 8 million international migrants worldwide, which, if you go to the next slide, is equivalent to the sixth largest country in the world. So we're talking about a lot of people, and um, my, the process of migration brings with it a number of um, both, you know, well, we'll just say a number of challenges uh, for, for uh, health care for those people who are migrating. And you can go to the next slide. Um, so in the, within the United States, you know, we are accustomed to thinking of agriculture as one of the economic sectors that relies most on migratory labor. But in reality, um, and I'm not going to go through all of it, we have a short period of time, but there's a number of um, there's a number of different industries that rely on migrant labor. You'll see that in everything from um, uh, workers coming in to deal with disaster relief after something has happened. There's construction work, there's fishery, people that come in to do fisheries work up in various parts of the country. Um, in the West here where I live, um, you'll see a lot of migrant labor coming in to deal with forest fires. So, you know, the list goes on that it's not just, it's not just farm workers. And you can go to the next slide. So within the, with in the Migrant Clinicians Network, what we really try and talk about is an intersection between poverty, migration, and health. You go next slide. And we, we talk about migrant health, and you can sort of go through this, this slide here, but um, as these things are popping up, I just want you to think about, we, we really talk about um, mobility and migrant labor, um, and we're not talking about, you know, snowbirds necessarily or, you know, people who are, who are you know, moving for a high-tech job or whatever, but people who are working in low-wage, um, high-risk industries, that there, there are sort of two main things that you have to keep in mind as if you're a clinician or you're someone working in the healthcare with, with this population. One is that, that the migratory lifestyle brings with it a set of um, challenges to healthcare, and that's some of what we're talking about. And then also that, that people may be exposed to, to different sorts of things. So it's not necessarily that, they, that people who are migrating have worse health, but they're dealing with different kinds of challenges. And these include the things that are listed here. Um, and one of the really key things is inherent dangers and health risks of occupation. And we talk about this. We actually did a webinar recently, which um, I'd be happy to share with anyone, looks at um, occupation and diabetes care and how that all factors in. You can go next slide. Um, some of the clinical issues that may be um, a little bit different than what you would see otherwise is um, looking at trauma, um, both trauma in countries or locations of origin, as well as increasingly in this country, um, we're seeing trauma for people who are, have come to this, who are experiencing trauma here in this country. Um, TB and other infectious diseases are an issue. Diabetes and cardiovascular disease, not that the rates are higher in a migrating population, but that, um, that you may, uh, that there are additional challenges to being mobile. And, and working in a high-risk occupation that impact um, your diabetes care. And then some of these other pieces that are really, um, really critical that if we had more time, I could go into more depth, but um, 
but sort of know that these are these are issues that are facing this population. And you can go next slide. And then for health centers, those of you who are there um, working on the front line at a health center, there are challenges um, that that we hope to be able to help you help mitigate for you. But looking at you know how do you create a patient centered mo medical home for patients who are mobile. Um, it does also require an understanding and, and asking about someone's occupation and, and sort of where they're com where what their life circumstances are. And I think that is a thread that really runs throughout this discussion of social determinants of health is really being able to, to really have finding the time to ask patients about the uh, factors that they're dealing with in their lives and being able to, to incorporate that into their um, treatment plans. Um, looking at health literacy and cultural differences, realistic appointment schedules and walk-in capacity for patients that may not have transportation, that may have very um, lim restrictive uh, work schedules. Um, so looking at all of those challenges. And then access to medication and specialists and really care overall because this is, and I will say not to get into politics, but it in an increasingly challenging environment for um, a number of people in this population to to find that care where they're where they end up. So next slide. Oh, reimbursement for services. So I want to talk about so the migrant clinicians network. We have a number of of um, resources. We have some diabetic diabetes specific resources as well as other things. But I wanted to round out my conversation with you today to talk about one tool that's available to all health centers that's free and it's our health network program and it's a bridge case management program for mobile patients. So if you have a mobile patient, if you have a patient that you think may be moving on, um, whether they're in agriculture, whether they're homeless, whether they um, just have very tenuous living circumstances and you're not certain that you're going to be able, they're going to be coming back, you can enroll them in our program and we provide them with case management services um, virtually. Uh, where they end up, we help them find care, we transfer their records. And so all of these things that are listed here um, are elements of the program. If you can go to the next slide, I'll go into a little bit more depth on it. Um, just to let you know, diabetes is one of the health conditions that we have. We have a number of patients enrolled who have diabetes. And then all of these other things that you see here, really we take any patients with any health condition. Go to the next slide. Um, and within the health network program, um, at this juncture, we have worked with, with we work all over the world. Um, so if you have a patient that's moving, we, you know, we'll routinely have patients that may, you know, may have been diagnosed with tuberculosis and they're moving back to South Africa or something like that. And the clinic can enroll them and we can make sure that they get care where they end up. And we also make sure that the enrolling clinic receives all of the information um, about that patient so that they can close out their records. So it helps a lot for clinics um, in, in maintaining their data and being able to maintain their reporting. Next slide. Just to say that at this point, we've had over, over 11,000 total enrollments of patients that we're following. And, and to be clear, some of these patients are relatively short term, like a, a patient with tuberculosis, for instance, may have a six month treatment. Um, and so we would follow them for that period of time. But other patients and those with chronic diseases, diabetes, for instance, we would follow for a long time. And I have a brief case study on um, that maybe the next slide. Um, not quite yet. So I'm echoing all of a sudden, not sure why. but. Um, so just to, to let you know real quickly about the enrollment criteria, it's just that the patient is mobile or migrant and, and may or may not be thinking of leaving the area. You can enroll a patient that you that may not be migrating yet, but has the potential to, and that would be fine too. And then we may not end up having to do anything with them. But then these are some of the other things and you can look through your slides um, and see that. But you can go to the next slide. So this is just a brief case study, and you can go through this, but um, this was a, a farm worker. This case was a little bit, um, I had this slide, and we have some more recent cases, but this is an illustrative one. Who um, was? He's a farm worker who was diagnosed with diabetes at age 49, and um, he traveled from South Texas to Minnesota or wherever he can find work. And you can go through, you can just keep clicking through the animation here. Um, he was enrolled in uh, 2002, and then 
um, no, keep going in the animation. You can just keep going on it. You can just see he moved. These are, this is, you know, we keep track of all of this. This is all the times that he moved. Um, and then ultimately in 2003, so we followed him for over 10 years and um, we closed it out because he was no longer migrating at that point. And you can go to the next slide. Um, this is the number of patient contacts that we had with that particular person. You can go to the next slide. Um, and then, um, sorry, my timer is going off, which means it's time for me to end. But just to let you know, on the diabetes front, um, his hemoglobin A1C, when he when he first was enrolled with Health Network, was at 14, and that shouldn't be a percent, <laughs> but it's at 14. And then, um, if you go through the animation there, you can see that there was a period of time in which he was not involved in Health Network and his, his hemoglobin A1C went back up again. But over time, um, being enrolled in Health Network just allowed him to, he was able to get care, he was able to get access to medication, and, and um, mobility s sort of ceased to be a major s social determinant of health for him. And you go to the next slide. Um, so just to... And this is all in your slides, so I'll leave I'll leave that for you guys to read. But just some information about what Health Network is and what we can do for you. And then the following slide is some contact information about um, how you can get in touch with us if you're interested. We'd love to hear from anybody. And um, we, you know, if you're interested in in scheduling a a training for your health center, it's free to the health centers, it's free to the patients. And so just contact me um, or contact any of these numbers. And I believe that is it for me. Thank you, Jillian. We're going to go welcome. ahead and move on in our presentation for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. So we, uh, do we have Saki on the line? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. Um, okay, great. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's training. And uh, my name is Saki Malikcho, and I am the Manager of Policy Research and Health Promotion at the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Next slide, please. So today I have a, a brief presentation. Today I'm going to describe some background and context on who public housing residents are, their health status, and some of the social determinants of health affecting them, particularly as it relates to the prevalence and management of type 2 diabetes. And then I'm going to provide some findings and best practices on addressing those determinants from our clinical quality advisory group. Next slide, please. So for those of you that aren't familiar, the National Center for Health and Public Housing provides training, technical assistance, and research and support of community health centers and partners, including public health housing agencies. We're a national cooperative agreement funded in part by the Bureau of Primary Health Care from HHSS. And I should note that the information and opinions presented here are those of the National Center. Next slide. So um, as you may know, health centers deliver affordable, accessible, quality, cost-effective primary health care to patients regardless of their ability to pay. There are 1,400 health centers that receive federal funding through HRSA, and those health centers provide care for about 26 million people. Of those, there are 341 health centers that are located in or immediately accessible to public housing. That means that the health center is either directly located on the property or it's physically close to the development. So the proximity really depends on the community, um, but it's in a location that's easy to get to or there's transportation that um, public housing residents can access. There are also 105 health centers that receive specialized grants called Public Housing Primary Care or PHPC grants to provide care specifically for public housing residents. Next slide. Um, and in this case, when we say public housing, we're referring to agency-owned or developed low-income housing, which includes about 30% of all the individuals that receive assistance through HUD. Next slide, please. So approximately 2.2 million people live in public housing. Um, about 38% are children, 17% are seniors. Um, the average annual income is around $13,000 a year, so 83% live in or at the federal poverty level. Next slide. Um, and residents of public housing um, have worse health compared to the national average. So last year, for the first time, have released a report that gives a snapshot of the health of individuals um, that receive some type of HUD assistance. 
and the report was a collaboration between CDC and HUD, and it links data from the National Health Interview Survey with administrative data from HUD. And what it shows is that adults in HUD-assisted housing have higher rates of chronic health conditions and are greater utilizers of healthcare than the general population. They're more likely to be in fair or poor health, overweight or obese, disabled, be smokers, have asthma, have COPD. Um, and I want to point out that these disparities are quite severe. In the case of diabetes, the prevalence rate is two times higher than that of the general population. Next slide, please. Um, but the problem isn't just a higher prevalence, it's also the severity of the disease. This is a map that shows the percent of diabetic patients seen at public housing primary care health centers with uncontrolled diabetes, and we define that as HbA1c levels greater than 9. Um, HbA1c is, um, not only provides a reliable measure of, of chronic hyperglycemia, but it also correlates well with the risk of long-term diabetes complications. So nationally, about 18% of patients with diabetes have HbA1c levels greater than 9, but for patients at public housing primary care centers, the average is 32%. And as you can see on the map, there's a lot of variation on the percent of patients with uncontrolled diabetes, but in fact, 96 out of the 105 PHPCs have a higher percentage of patients with uncontrolled diabetes compared to the national average. Next slide, please. Um, so there are a number of reasons why diabetes um, is so pervasive for public housing residents, and we asked the medical directors at PHPCs what social determinants they thought were the most pressing for this patient population, and, and their answers included poverty, unemployment, low educational attainment, as well as access to healthy food. Next slide, please. Um, food insecurity is actually a problem across the country. Nationally, about 15% of the U.S. population report that they don't have enough food for a healthy, active lifestyle. And in counties where PHPCs are located, that's also the case. About 16% of the population say they're food insecure. But as you can imagine, there's some variation in food insecurity across the country. For example, in Buncombe, North Carolina, 26% are food insecure. And in Clark, Georgia, 21% say they have limited access to healthy food. Um, the challenge with public housing residents is that they also tend to live in food deserts. Um, a USDA map, which is not pictured here, shows that low-income populations are more likely to have limited access to a grocery store than other income groups. And so they rely on going to local corner stores, which don't always have fresh produce or healthy options available. Lack of transportation is also a challenge, so going to the grocery store can also be hard to do. Next slide, please. Um, physical activity is also important for the management of diabetes and prediabetes. A geospatial analysis finds that 87.5% of the population living in counties where PHPCs are located have um, access to extra exercise opportunities through parks or trails. Um, but 22% report that they do not engage in any leisure time physical activity. Um, and that's because access to extra size opportunities sometimes isn't enough. There are other factors that influence decisions um, to be physically active. And for public housing residents, neighborhood safety can be a factor. Next slide, please. So a meta-analysis on the relationship between crime, perceived safety, and physical activity show that those living in areas where they felt unsafe or in areas with higher crime have a 28% reduced odds of achieving higher levels of physical activity. And the rates of violent crime are certainly higher in areas where PHPCs are located compared to the national average, 508 versus 386. Next slide, please. And the same goes for firearm fatalities. The average number of firearm deaths in PHPC counties is 11 per 100,000 population compared to the national average, which is four. And in places like New Orleans, the rate is extremely high. It's from 44. And of course, these are county estimates. We expect that rates vary by neighborhood. Next slide, please. Um, but violence, crime, and the cumulative stress of poverty and unemployment and all of those other determinants play a role in the mental health of public housing residents. Public housing residents are more likely to report psychological distress. Um, those are feelings of anxiety, depression, hopelessness, um, and distress with mental hardship, which means that those feelings are interfering with the, their daily activities compared to the general population. And that's important when we talk about diabetes because Stress plays a role in what we choose to eat, um, as well as how our bodies metabolize food. 
and it affects other types of health behaviors. Next slide. Such as um, smoking. So 33% of public housing residents smoke compared to 22% of the general population. And while smoking rates in the general population have declined over the last decade, they still remain high for this patient population. So it's important um, that this health issue isn't overlooked, particularly because we know that smoking increases your chance of developing diabetes by 30 to 40 percent. Um, it makes diabetes harder to control, and um, smokers are more likely to develop complications like heart and kidney failure, retinopathy, leg or foot amputation. Next slide, please. So we asked our clinical quality working group from public housing primary care centers how they're working to address the social determinants of health for the diabetic public housing patients. Um, so this is the list of the PHPCs that currently participate in that group, and it consists of a range of clinical providers, including physicians and nurses and pharmacists. And I'm going to briefly describe some of the diabetes prevention and management strategies that they've shared. Um, next slide. So the first set of examples address um, increasing access to fresh fruits and vegetables. As I mentioned earlier, um, one of the common barriers for public housing residents is lack of transportation and living in a food desert. So um, the medical director from TCA Health discussed the efforts of the health center to improve access to food through a green veggie bus. So this is a mobile van that sells vegetables once a week at the health center. Um, this health center is located directly on the housing development site. So the van provides healthy foods predominantly to the public housing residents, and it also accepts WIC coupons as payment. La Maestra um, has a community garden at the health center and a health educator that teaches patients how to plant and grow their own food and provides nutrition and cooking education um, to the members of the community. The health center also has a food pantry for the homeless that exclusively stocks the healthy foods, um, nothing with high salt or sugar content. And then the El Rio Health Center in Tucson, Arizona, collaborates with a community food bank and a university to provide a food prescription program. So patients that receive a prescription for healthy food can purchase items at a discount price at the local grocery store and the farmer's market. And the health center also works with the National Park Service to prescribe parks and guided activities for public housing residents. And that health center has been able to secure funding for transportation and admission fees for their patients. Next slide, please. Um, so another factor the health center staff must consider and navigate is community violence. So um, the medical staff um, realized that patients in the community don't like to go out at night. So the TCA health center had to be flexible and responsive, and therefore they changed their clinic hours to reflect those needs. Um, now they offer a wellness exercise program twice a week in the early evening, and they've seen their attendance rate increase because of that. Next slide, please. Um, some health centers collect data and social factors that influence health for each patient and use that information to determine the appropriate follow-up and referral services that they provide. Um, for example, the Tucson Health Center uses a kiosk-based survey of social determinants of health for all of their patients in their waiting room. Um, so depending on the responses, patients are linked to nutrition and exercise programs. Um, in La Maestra, um, they have been collecting social determinants of health data for the last 20 years. It's embedded in their EHR system. Their vendor, NextGen, has a social determinants of health template um, that serves as kind of a central point to gather and input data on things like transportation and language. Um, and La Maestra customizes their template for their own needs, and then they use that data to target outreach. Um, they've incorporated the pharmacy into the design to tailor treatment plans for patients with certain characteristics, and the clinical information that they've used um, on diabetes has resulted in an increase in their compliance rate by 5 to 6 percent. Other centers like um, San Ysidro Health Center use a different approach. They surveyed the local um, the social determinants of, of health data in the community, and they've identified um, areas where they were most in need for certain services. Um, then using grant funding, they hired and trained promotoras or community health workers to bring programs into the community. Next slide. So I know that was very brief, and I kind of rushed through the examples, but I just wanted to provide some, a highlight of, of the health status of public housing residents and what health centers are doing to address them. But essentially, it's about 
you know, knowing and understanding the barriers of your patient population and then trying to be adaptive and flexible um, to address them. And the next slide. Um, this is our social media information. Thank you. Thanks so much, Saki. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to our colleagues at the National LGBT Health Education Center. Alex, you can go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Sharina. Hi, everybody. And uh, thank you for the time to speak with you all today. Just trying to figure out how to advance the slide, Sharina. I don't know oh, you can just say next slide, Alex. We have it over here at the National mm -hmm. Center. Thanks. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Great. Thank you. So why is it important to have tailored programs for LGBTQ people that address social determinants of health? Healthy People 2020 and the Institute of Medicine convened national experts, reviewed the evidence-based literature, and concluded that there really are unique health disparities faced by sexual and gender minority people that are tied to a variety of social determinants of health. And we therefore need to tailor our health systems and health programs within health centers to address these unique experiences that LGBTQ people have, to have programs within health centers that address social determinants in order to achieve the same quality of health for LGBTQ people that the rest of the population experiences and enjoys. Next slide. I've used this term LGBTQ a couple of times, like it's one homogenous population where everybody has the same experiences, the same social determinants of health, and therefore the same needs from our health centers. The reality is each of these subpopulations, the L, the G, the B, the T, the Q, have unique experiences, unique social determinants, and therefore need tailoring of programs and services accordingly. Next slide. A lot of terms get used when we start focusing on caring for LGBTQ people that can be confusing and overwhelming at first. So let's just walk through this very briefly. Next slide. First important point to make, and a, a lot of the uh, misconceptions about this are not unrelated to the social determinants of health faced by LGBTQ people. First big point to make is that sexual orientation and gender identity are not the same thing. Each of us has both a sexual orientation and a gender identity, one of each. And the terms and concepts related to sexual orientation and gender identity that a given person uses will evolve throughout their lifespan. You can imagine someone may initially identify as straight and later identify as gay, initially identify as a man and later identify as a woman, for example. And the terms we've used throughout history have evolved very quickly. Uh, terms we use now are different than the ones we used 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, even a year ago. We had to recently update our glossary of terms. Uh, I'm hearing new terms from my um, LGBTQ younger patients in the last few months that I hadn't heard a year ago. So part of this in the broader societal context is a very rapid uh, cultural and even linguistic uh, revolution. Next slide. Gender identity is a person's inner sense of being a boy, man, a girl, woman of another gender or no gender. And this is a core fundamental part of people's identity. When uh, Norm Spack founded the Boston Children's uh, Hospital uh, Trans Kids Clinic, he would always used to say gender lies within the soul, gender exists within the soul. So this is really a big part of who we are. In most countries and cultures around the world, babies are born and are assigned one of two sexes based on external anatomy, male or female. We now appreciate through uh, reduced stigma and uh, ability for patients to share this with us, that these babies become children, adolescents, and adults who may have a gender identity, an inner sense of their gender that doesn't line up in a traditional sense with the sex they were assigned at birth. Similarly, Gender expression is much more complicated than we realized. People have many different parameters along which they express their gender. Each of us has ways in which society may consider us more traditionally masculine and other ways in which we may be considered more traditionally feminine, whatever those terms mean. And uh, we're expanding our societal concepts of this. It, people aren't just boy, girl, man, woman. Uh, a lot of people have non-binary gender identities, other gender experiences entirely. Next slide. The term transgender refers to people whose gender identity doesn't line up in a traditional sense with the sex they were assigned at birth. So a big obstacle in terms of social determinants really that trans people experience every day is that people don't know how to refer to them, how to talk to them, what pronouns to use, what name to use. Someone assigned male sex at birth who identifies as a woman may refer to themselves as a transgender woman, a trans woman. We hear terms like male to female or MTF. Similarly, someone assigned female sex at birth who identifies as a man may refer to themselves as transgender man, trans man, 
use of terms like female to male or FTM. People with non-binary gender identities, uh, most commonly that I've heard will refer to themselves as genderqueer, but there are other new terms emerging that uh, people are increasingly using to refer to themselves. In terms like transmasculine and transfeminine, tell you which gender spectrum someone uh, falls along, but it's more inclusive of people with non-binary identities. Next slide. In contrast to gender identity, sexual orientation is how a person identifies physical and emotional attractions to other people. We think of this in three components. Desire, this is whom someone isn't, is or isn't attracted to. Um, when I was in med school, I was trained to ask if people are attracted to men, women, or both. We moved beyond that. Now we say, what are the genders of the people you're attracted to? Behavior is whom someone is or isn't engaging in sexual activity with and what kind of sexual activity. So we use terms like men who have sex with men, men who have sex with men and women, women who have sex with women, women who have sex with women and men. And identity refers to the labels and communities in society that us refer to sexual orientation and that a person may or may not identify with and accept. For example, there are a lot of men who have sex with men, don't identify as gay, don't identify as bisexual, don't identify as queer, may identify as straight. So we have to let people self-identify within our healthcare systems, and that's a big part of um, being more inclusive of people with a range of social determinants related to sexual orientation and gender identity. Next slide. For clinical care, research, and designing health systems for uh, LGBTQ people, we often use a minority stress framework. The idea is that sexual and gender minority people from the time we're kids to older adulthood experience everyday discrimination, victimization, microaggressions, frank violence at a much higher prevalence than other people do. This can lead to disruptions in general psychological processes like interpersonal uh, functioning, coping skills, emotional regulation, uh, internal stigma-related stress like internalized homophobia, internalized transphobia, believing all the negative things society says about your sexual orientation or gender identity, concealing your identity, expecting rejection because you're so used to it. All of this we think is related to the higher prevalence of behavioral health problems among LGBTQ people like depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, poor self-care, decreased engagement in primary care, and down the road a much higher prevalence of various physical health problems like the higher prevalence of HIV among men who have sex with men and transgender women. So these external stigma-related stressors, these social determinants of health and minority stress is directly related to worse physical and mental health. Next slide. These health issues related to stigma and social determinants continue throughout the lifespan. Next slide. LGBTQ youth are more likely to attempt suicide, much more likely to experience homelessness, more likely to experience HIV and other sexually transmitted infections than their non-LGBTQ counterparts. Next slide. LGBTQ people have much higher prevalence of tobacco, alcohol, and drug use disorders. Lesbian and bisexual identified women are less likely to receive preventative services for cancer, even though the recommendations are for the same frequency of cervical paps, for example, for all women, regardless of sexual orientation. Transgender people in a large study of 6,000 adults are more likely to use drugs and alcohol to cope with discrimination and more likely to smoke cigarettes than the general population. Next slide. Trans folks are more likely to experience serious psychological distress, much more likely to attempt suicide, 40% lifetime suicide attempt prevalence compared to 4.6% in the general population. And in terms of social determinants, it's hard enough to find care teams competent and confident and willing to provide gender affirming medical care. 55% of trans folks who sought coverage for surgery were denied in the past year, and 25% who sought coverage for gender affirming hormone therapy were denied. Even though we have laws on the books prohibiting discrimination, enforcement has been hit or miss in terms of uh, connection between uh, legal determinants of health and, and uh, gender affirmation. This is all considered medically necessary treatment by the American Medical Association. Next slide. Trans people are much more likely to report negative experiences like verbal harassment or being refused treatment, more likely to not seek needed health care due to fear of gender-related mistreatment, and to not go to a health care provider because they couldn't afford it in the context of pervasive employment discrimination and housing discrimination. Next slide. How do we overcome these barriers, these social determinants of health? Next slide. Big part of this is collecting sexual orientation and gender identity information within health centers. In 2016, the Bureau of Primary Healthcare mandated SOGI data collection at all FQHCs across the country. This is important to end LGBTQ invisibility within healthcare so that we can provide patient-centered care, tailor our approach according to people's sexual orientation and gender identity, and also do population health management where we can see 
differences in health disparities experienced by LGBTQ people. So we like to say, if you're not counted, you don't count. We have to end this invisibility. Next slide. This is one example of why a real de-identified patient, Javier is a 45-year-old man who came in with pain on x-ray, but appeared to be metastases from an unknown primary cancer. He had breast reduction, developed breast cancer in his remaining uh, breast tissue, he had chest construction surgery to remove his breast. The transgender man, it turns out, this health center wasn't engaging in sensitive, effective communication, transgender people and asking systematically for gender identity information. So Jake didn't feel comfortable coming out as trans until the cancer had metastasized, even though he had a family history of breast cancer and his mother and sister. Next slide. Important to have non-discrimination policies for LGBTQ people that name sex orientation, gender identity, gender expression. These have to be posted prominently for all patients and staff to be aware and know what the process and recourse is. Next slide. Important to review language on forms and in processes at the front desk, for example. Avoid using terms like husband, wife, mother, father, son, daughter. Instead, use terms like parent or guardian, spouse or partners, and uh, children. Next slide. Training staff to know how to use pronouns, particularly important for transgender and gender non-binary folks. Some pronouns we're more familiar with, like he, him, his, or she, her, hers. Increasingly, non-binary folks use pronouns they, them, theirs in the singular. This takes practice, but is really important for affirming um, trans and non-binary folks and reducing the stigma people experience within health centers. There are also other pronouns specifically developed for this purpose, like z, he, or hers. You can find resources related to all this on our website, lgbthealtheducation.org. Next slide. Physical environment has to be inclusive. What are the uh, posters and pamphlets in the waiting room? What kind of educational or marketing materials are you using? Do these depict same-sex couples? Do you explicitly refer to gender-affirming services for transgender people? Are there all gender restrooms throughout your um, health center for trans and non-binary folks to not uh, feel unsafe, like they're going to get pulled out of the restroom because someone's gender policing. This is a huge form of structural stigma, not having access to all gender restrooms. Next slide. Engaging with the local LGBTQ community is critical for addressing these social determinants. They re really can inform uh, creating an inclusive and welcoming environment at the health center, co-sponsoring or hosting community events in collaboration with local LGBTQ organizations, recognizing LGBTQ awareness holidays like LGBTQ Health Week, National Coming Out Day, and Trans Day of Remembrance when we remember transgender people who've died of suicide or homicide. Inviting LGBTQ leaders to have a voice in the planning of your health center, uh, to be on the board, on community advisory or leadership boards, assessing the local needs of the LGBTQ community by holding focus groups or surveys at events like Pride to make sure you're being responsive, bringing key LGBTQ stakeholders to the table. Next slide. And that's about it. We're at 12 minutes and 30 seconds. I was given 13 minutes. This is our um, National Cooperative Agreement, the National LGBT Health Education Center at the Fenway Institute. We're based at a federally qualified health center in Boston. Uh, we have a range of uh, webinars on all kinds of LGBTQ health topics available for free, 60 plus publications you can download for free as PDFs on LGBTQ health topics. Our National Transgender Conference talks are all recorded for free. Demonstration videos about how to collect sexual orientation gender identity data uh, all available to you at lgbthealtheducation.org. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. And if you have any additional questions for Alex, please feel free to send those in the chat box, and we will get to them at the end of our presentations today. So now we're going to go ahead and transition into our last uh, content presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Peter at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, Equitable Care for the Elders. And go ahead and take it away, Peter. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, I'm in Boston. I just want to thank Alex. And I want to say just anecdotally, Alec, I know of at least five people who you saved their lives in your uh, Fenway Health Center. So uh, it's really nice to hear you present. My name is Peter Marimaldi. I'm with the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. I'm on the faculty there. I also have faculty appointments at the Harvard School of Public Health, and I have an appointment at the, Harvard, uh, at the Simmons School of Social Work. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to focus today specifically on older adults uh, and some of the unique characteristics of working with older adults. And, and you'll be interested to, to see, next slide please, uh, some of the words uh, that are used to describe old people. So I always like to start with definitions. When you hear the word old, it's so relative. 
you know, I talk to my uh, 10-year-old daughter, and for her, old is about 25. So I think you all have these kinds of experiences. But um, if you think about it, you know, I've done interviews with old people uh, for many years, and I've heard people describe themselves as an old, gnarly tree. It's very interesting to think about what that really means and how we use the word old. Sometimes people avoid the word old, and it depends. And, the, you know, the context is absolutely critical. Next slide, please. When I think of old, this is the way I think of it. There's the young old, ages 65 to 74, and these are generally agreed upon uh, categorizations. The middle age old, 75 to 84. The oldest old are 85 to 99 and centurions. Uh, the woman on the right is a Portuguese woman who's over 100 years old. If you look, think about it now, This, this, uh, you think about the baby boomers, anywhere between eight and 10,000 people turn 65 every single day since 2011. And this baby boom generation is really changing the way healthcare has to think about the provision of care. The largest, uh, there's an enormous growth in this middle old, the 75 to 84 age group, and it's really not uncommon. Many of you probably have patients who are 85 and older. Next slide, please. Um, the um, picture here. What do these three old people have in common? If you think about it. Uh, by the way, by way of full disclosure. I'm the person in the middle. And what we really have in common, just uh, the person on the left uh, is the oldest. The person on the right brought her to, uh, to meet with me. And the person on the right is 87 years old. And she brought that 103-year-old woman to meet me. And uh, I'm officially considered old. I just make the breakdown. But what we all have in common is that we can ambulate. We're all standing there. And I think what we often forget in healthcare is that there's a certain bias to who people, the people who can show up in our provision centers, in our wherever we are, wherever we're providing services. It's the folks who are homebound that we have to be concerned about. Next slide, please. So words that come to mind for older adults, all of this is directly from qualitative interviews, uh, either uh, focus groups or individual interviews. On the left, you see the kind of, and you know, it's sort of an implicit bias. People are slow, uh, they're declining in mobility, they're declining in their cognitive ability, uh, they have all these illnesses, multiple chronic conditions, they're just dependent, they really cost a fortune, very stubborn. I told them to do something, they didn't do it. Isolation is a big issue. Uh, they, the notion of being isolated, they're burdens to communities. And the bottom line is this, I want you to think about how unattractive some people see old people. So it's interesting how uh, if you take a child into a nursing home, and I've done this and I've seen this many times, uh, unsocialized, a child will find an old person's skin very interesting. You know, think about the texture. and They'll reach out, they'll try to touch it. But we're somehow conditioned to think and we're socialized to think that there's something unattractive about old, getting old. We're a youth-oriented culture. On the positive side, we think about older people, if we were in a gerontocracy, for example, as being very thoughtful, how adaptive they are. It's amazing to see how people manage in their homes. If you, if you visit elders in their homes, uh, little tricks they have to get their socks on, to retrieve their mail, to get across the room. They're incredibly resilient. Uh, and in, uh, to be very candid about it, right now, with the elimination of a lot of entry-level jobs, uh, home care agencies provide real employment opportunities, and entrepreneurs, increasingly, you're going to see, uh, in my travels around the country, I'm pretty astounded at some of the great innovation, but it's coming out of private equity. So there's real revenue to be had. That baby boom generation has more wealth than any generation previously. I think of old people as being not stubborn, but as strong-willed. They're managing uh, to survive. There's a lot of old people who have lived through very hard times, and uh, they've been left with this incredible will to survive. Um, in a gerontocracy, I, in a lot of communities, uh, it, different types of communities, different ethnicities, different races, you'll see that the elders sometimes are the anchors in the community that will often show up in, in uh, uh, places of worship. Uh, and there's something very beautiful about an old person. Think of that slide previously. Next slide, please. So think about the characteristics of aging. Um, changes in the skin, increased risk of disease and illness. But you can look through this list, and you see that 
the common theme is either seen as loss or change. And as providers, it's very important to understand that while an elder mice may perceive themselves as losing a lot of function, in reality, we can help them understand that they're changing and that their changes will lead them to what as much and as fulfilled a life as possible. Next slide, please. Focusing now on social determinants, I always think of Yuri Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory. And if you, um, I always think about if you drop uh, a drop of water into a pond and it just spreads out, and if you drop multiple drops, you'll see that each one affects the other. In an older person's life, this, ec this ecosystem that they live in is constantly changing. And if you look here at the, the person in the center, the family has often moved away or the family is changing, or the family has different different needs, the church, everything around them has changed. Uh, it's not uncommon to find an old person aging at home in a, a neighborhood that may have changed very dramatically, ethnically, racially. Uh, it may have gentrified, and you have this old person holding out in the neighborhood, and how that impacts on every aspect of their life. Next slide, please. So let's think about these upstream issues. Um, you know, we're notorious uh, when we talk about social determinants of health. We're notorious for waiting people, waiting for people to fall in the river and then fish them out, and then we take care of them in ways that are very expensive, very labor intensive, and then we just let them all wander off and fall back in the river, and then we'll put all our resources there. You know this, but. If you think about it, uh, and, it, and it was said earlier, this notion of how can people have access uh, to healthy food due to finances, transportation is a dramatic deterrent. We're talking about barriers for older people. We'll think nothing of saying, okay, go and see this specialist and come back and see me in the morning. Uh, that's an enormous undertaking just to get out of the house if a person has limited ADLs, areas of daily living, or IADLs. Um, the other thing to consider is personal preferences. I can't tell you how many people I've interviewed who have told me they would rather die a few years earlier than not eat bacon every morning. It's astonishing. I watch all the, the diets on some people and I'm saying, why are you eating that? It's because that's what they like. If people have poor oral health or if they don't have teeth, it's very difficult to bite into an apple or eat some fruits, if you, even if they have access to it. Mobility issues, um, very often prevent a regular exercise. We can say try to get some exercise, but it's tough if you're in constant pain with arthritis, for example. Uh, social isolation is very, very de uh, is a detriment, and it can lead to all kinds of problems. And uh, in my uh, travels around the country, I've been spent the last year interviewing um, elders and their caregivers and medical teams providing care for them in different parts of the United States. Across the board, everybody talks about social isolation as being one of the greatest challenges to aging in place and how difficult that is and how that complicates things. The comorbid chronic conditions in terms of self-care, how they receive home health, and polypharmacy, the complications with polypharmacy are dramatic. It's not unusual to hear somebody um, describe a caregiver, a family caregiver, how they're uh, administering very complicated medications. Uh, to an elder, and are they qualified? That's a question to be asked. Uh, I mentioned transportation, but more importantly, anytime there's this disjointed medical care, you know, uh, I'll come back to this notion of the electronic health record, but it's very hard for uh, a young person to be seen by multiple providers. You know, think about how an older person's slowing down in every way, physically, cognitively. It's very difficult. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I, rather than bombarding you with surveillance, I just, you know, you all know this, but, you know, the, um, uh, the diagnosis of diabetes, but more importantly, next slide, please. But they're li older people are living with multiple chronic conditions. Look at the numbers here, the people with three or more uh, chronic conditions and managing all of these medications and the polypharmacy and the medical appointments and the self-care and the home health that goes along with this is complicated both for the elder and also for the providers. Next slide, please. So uh, 
what can we do to help older people with type, type 2 diabetes? Uh, first and foremost is going into it, give yourself a little extra time. Uh, they talk slower, they move slower, and if you interview elders, if you work with elders, you know that they get a little annoyed that these young whippersnappers are in such a rush all the time. Interprofessional teams are critical because it's a way for uh, people to have, with specific disciplinary competencies to spend the time needed with an individual. Uh, this notion of um, who's doing what for who, but then coordinating it becomes very difficult. I'm not going to read through these, but um, if you can use behavior change theories to understand why someone still wants to have eggs and bacon every morning, and rather than just saying, hey, stop eating that kind of food, to say, what would it take for you to eat a little bit less or try something else or instead of that snack have this snack what would it take and listen to them but again that takes time coordinating with home health services is very difficult uh, engaging new community resources and I think we have to create new ones now my time's just about up but I I hope that you'll think about um, understand that without an advocate and I hear this across the board from providers from caregivers and from elders themselves without an advocate Old people are at great risk. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and put the contact information in the chat box. We will have this contact information available for you all after the session as well. But if you have any further questions uh, for Harvard Dental, please feel free to contact uh, the emails that I just sent to the group in the chat box. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our question and answer session. Section. We have gotten some questions in advance, and I want to make sure that we have time to go through everything that has been sent already. But I do want to welcome you all to send any additional questions that you have for any of our four presenters today. But we're going to go ahead and go back and to the beginning of our presentation today and start with Jillian over at Migrant Clinicians Network. So uh, Jillian, I'll just ask if you can unmute yourself, and I'll just test that before we go ahead and get started. Jillian? Okay, while we're waiting for uh, I, I apologize. I had oh, okay. I had I, I had double muted myself just to <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. All right, Jillian. So thank you so much for your presentation. I'll give you some space um to go into any additional details that you have um based on the information that you provided today. But I do have a couple questions um that came in as well. So um, there was a question that was asked if all clinics were interconnected. So there was an organization that works specifically with Korean patients, and mm. they were wondering if a Korean migrant were to come to, let's say, New York City, would they have to re-enroll? So if if you're talking specifically about our health network program, then um, then no. The the idea is it's not so much that the clinics are are interconnected. It's um, if you think of Health Network as um, kind of a net over top of all of the clinics so that um, if a Korean patient is enrolled in a health center in, um, you know, Maine or wherever that person may be and then moves to a clinic in New York, it's not that those clinics are connected, it's that that person is enrolled in our program and so that we would then work with the patient and the clinic in New York to make sure that that patient gets into care and that their records are transferred and that they're seeing the appropriate provider and, and all of that. So that's, if if that helps to clarify things a little bit. Sorry, thank you. And um, we have another question. Uh, can migra so sorry, can non-migrant serving organizations refer patients to uh, HN, excuse me, I'm sorry, the abbreviation Health Network with HN. Yeah. Okay, Health yes, Network, yes. Absolutely. For mobile yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm, absolutely. We work with all kinds of organizations. We work with hospitals, we work with um, health departments. Um, we work with private providers. So yes, absolutely, anybody can. 
They just have to have a provider of record. So we are not in this program. We have we have um, our medical directors oversee the work of the case managers, but we are not we are not treating. We're not you know diagnosing. We're just case managing those those patients. So they have to have a provider of record who enrolls them, and that's. So that we're working Great. under that umbrella. Okay, and um, if you can just elaborate a little bit more about the health centers that you have relationships with, with the health network, and if you work with state health information exchange networks at all. Um, so is that the HCCNs? I'm, I'm not. I'm not certain on that one, um, to be honest with you. But we, I know that we've done a lot of work with the um, health center controlled networks. And have some specific relationships with with them. With health centers, um, we just try and do outreach, and um, any health center is eligible to to work with us. Um, and we are happy to do trainings for any health centers, usually virtually, unless we happen to have a staff member located. Uh, we have staff members all over the country, so sometimes we can do in person trainings, but typically we do uh, virtual training. And um, so just through forums like this, getting the word out that it's a service that's available and we're happy to train your staff. We try and make it super simple. I mean, I know all of us here on the phone or on, you know, on this with you today, we, we all are very familiar with working within primary care settings and the need for, for any intervention that we develop to assist primary care. It has to be very simple. It has to be straightforward and it can't take be complicated and difficult to implement. So certainly Health Network operates on that principle, and we're happy to work with any health center. And can you um, clarify if this is a, a service that's provided for free to health centers, or is it, it is something provided that for is free. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's great. provided for free, and it's, and it's provided for free to the patient as well. So at this juncture, it's grant funded, um, and uh, some of that grant funding does come from HRSA. So um, yeah, so it's free. Okay. And then I just have a couple more, and we're going to wrap up with your section for now. Um, if a patient is enrolled in the health network, what happens if they ever leave the United States? Then they just need to, uh, what we do when we enroll any patient, um, and there's a little bit of that in the slides that I didn't really go, th go through in detail, but um, one of the things that we have to have in the enrollment is a number of somebody who will always have a good sense of where that person is going to be. So that could be their best friend, it could be their husband or wife, it could be their parent or child. Or um, so, if if someone leaves the United States, um, we work with countries all over the world and have very good connections there. So they, we just need to know that they're leaving the United States, and then. Um, we will work with the patient to get them into care where they end up. Um, and then sort of vice versa, when, if they come back to the United States, to get them back into care in the United States. Great. And just one final clarifying question. So the Health Information Exchange Network that was uh, talked about in a previous question, that's referring to an electronic way that patient information is exchanged amongst providers of care. So do you all oh. know if that, if that was um, something that you work with? So, yeah, and that's a, that's a big, long question. I, I don't want to take up all the time, but um, just to say that um, yes and no, like it's not part of, we are not part of electronic medical records at this juncture. And we have, um, we're really staying on the, on top of what's happening with that. But at this point in time, it's a combination of things. One is that, um, health centers, well, like, points of care across the country are at very different levels. And so, and there are so many different systems. And so there, at this point, there's really not, I mean, wouldn't it have been fantastic, you know, 15, 20 years ago, if everyone had sort of fallen in line behind one system, but that hasn't happened at this point. So um, we can certainly work with, we have worked with different um, EHR EM, um, systems to, incorporate health network as as el an element of that but it's not we are not I integrated into electronic medical records because there are just too many different systems and there's no interoperability between them at this point 
So I hope that that answers that question. Great. Thank you. But it's certainly and, an issue we deal with all the time. So, you know. And I just got confirmation that it did us. answer the question. Okay, <laughs> but, if, but if there is any additional follow-up, you can find uh, Jillian's contact information in the handout uh, in the PDF version of our slides. Thanks, Jillian. I'm going to go Thank ahead you. and go back to Saki. So we're going to go back to our National Center for, um, for Health and Public Housing. So Saki, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself. And while we're waiting, uh, if you have any additional questions for Saki, please go ahead and send those in the chat box. We do have a couple questions that I will be asking, and I'll just make sure that Saki is unmuted. Saki? Yes. Hi. 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 Welcome back. So um, <laughs> we just had a clarifying question about one of your statistics on FQHCs, federally qualified health centers, and the 26 million served. Did that number include all HUD assisted housing and not just public housing operated by public housing authorities? So the, the 26 million number is patients that are served at all the health centers that receive uh, their FQHCs. So um, ho public housing residents um, are, you know, are, there, so there are 341 health centers that are close to public housing um, developments, and but public housing residents can go to a number of places for their health care. So it doesn't mean um, that all public housing residents are going to health centers for to receive their care, but the 26 million is just kind of anyone that comes through the doors of a health center. So that great. That? Thank okay. you. And um, another question. Um, so somebody wanted to ask about patients that receive prescriptions for their healthy veggies and wellness time. Is this a collaborative effort with specific businesses, grocery stores, or community centers that provide these service for patients? Yes. Yeah, so the the health center works with uh, some of the local grocery stores, so that there are um, specific stores within the neighborhood that accept, that are working with the health center to, to provide that um, that discounted price for their food, and that's a relationship that the health center has built with, among the community, um, specifically in that uh, in that in that location. Thank you, and I do welcome you, uh, Saki, if you had any additional um, tidbits of information that you wish to share with the group. Um, I understand that we had a small amount of time for each of the presentations, but I do welcome any additional closing thoughts or comments or any resources that you want to direct people to at this moment. Sure, I, I just would direct people um, to some of the resources that we have on our website if they're interested in trying to identify if they're a health center, they're interested in building relationships with their local public housing authority or seeing where the public housing buildings are within their neighborhoods. We have maps that are available on our website um, where you can zoom in into your community and, and get uh, contact information and some demographic information on um, uh, the, the number of people that are living in the housing development site and, and who to contact to, to make um, uh, collaborations between your health center. Great, thanks. And we did have one final question come in for you. On the food discounts, do they have statistics on how uh, the discount has made food more attainable, or is there any outcome data that shows the results of these efforts? You know, I'm not sure. I will have to get in touch with um, that health center to find out if they there is measuring that type of um, evaluate or doing some type of evaluations on that. Um, but I can look that up and um, and get back to you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go back to Alex over at the National LGBT Health Education Center and get started there. So thank you again, Saki. Alex, are you able to unmute? Yeah, here I am. Hello, Alex. Welcome back. So um, I just wanted to start this conversation off and, and to ask you if there were any recommendations of any key resources that you wanted to point people to to assist with staff training on the content that you went through today. Sure. Great question. Thank you, Sharina. 
we, as I started to do my little shameless plug at the end of my presentation, we have an overwhelming um, number of resources on our website at lgbthealtheducation.org. The two I'm going to plug now, because they're relatively recent and they're directly relevant to what I talked about, and we're pretty psyched about them, are the new uh, Sexual Orientation Gender Identity Data Collection Toolkit that we launched only two months ago on the website, uh, approved by the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. So this is like the state of the art, uh, cutting edge of how to set up and improve SOGI data collection within your health center. It's called Ready, Set, Go, and it's on our website. The other thing we're um, really pumped about is the set of uh, instructional demonstration videos we just launched on our website. Again, all this you can use for free and share with your colleagues, the staff you supervise, anyone. Um, these are professional video, videos made with a professional filmmaking company and actors. I travel around the country for our uh, National Cooperative Agreement doing work in Alabama, Mississippi, Puerto Rico. Last week I was in Indiana and in Texas and everywhere I went, um, people were saying, you know, we really just want practical videos, like two to three minutes, that we can show our front desk staff or registration staff to say, this is how you ask SOGI, uh, SOGI questions at the front desk. This is how you deal with the fact that there is a client who um, is concerned about providing this information and is uh, offended about it. This is what you do when a parent comes in with a trans child, how you do things at the front desk and then what the clinician should say. This is how a clinician will uh, have a conversation with the patient who has a non-binary gender identity whose pronouns are Z, he, or hears. So we have 11 demonstration videos, really practical, uh, bite-sized, two to three minute videos with actors, and then there's a voice narration and text at the end saying uh, what was done well and what wasn't done well in these demonstration videos. So um, feel free to check those out, Th that's my plug. Thank you, Alex. And I do welcome you again, the space to elaborate on any additional uh, parts of your content that you went through or provide any additional information to the group um, outside of the plug that you just did. So if you have anything else that you wanted to go through, again, our time was very short. So I just wanted to make sure I gave you that space to elaborate if you had anything else that you wanted to talk through. Sure, thanks, Sharina. Well, certainly the um, Medical Legal Partnership brief we're putting together with you on uh, uh, serving trans folks is something people should look out for, so that's coming out soon. Um, we're doing that with uh, Medical Legal Partnership and, and Sharina's team. But um, a final thing that uh, tends to be um, well received and appreciated, we have a Transgender Health Echo program that we're now in our second year of, and 25 health centers committing their integrated primary medical care behavioral health teams to train up in trans care. We just had our monthly session yesterday uh, with expert faculty at Fenway Health uh, facilitating case discussion, and it always starts with a didactic by an expert on trans health. We're going to, for 25 spots now, uh, this year's ECHO, we had over 215 health centers apply last summer. We just closed applications for the one that's going to start in July, but we're going to have set, three different ones going at once, so 75 health centers. So applications will open in the next couple months for one starting in October and then another one starting in January. So um, stay on the lookout for that and you'll get it through the Bureau um, newsline and, and notices. Great, thank you so much, Alex. And I did put all of these uh, links in the chat box uh, for your publications and the webinars and the Trans Echo program. And thank you uh, again for your time. If there are any other additional questions that come in, I'll make sure to send those to you offline. And Alex did provide information to contact offline if you do have any further questions. Thanks again, Alex. Bye, right, Sharina, thank you. Bye. And I'm going to go ahead and transition over to Peter at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Uh, Peter, are you able to unmute again? Affirmative. Excellent. Okay. So um, we had a couple of questions that uh, were submitted for the facilitated question and answer, and I want to make sure that we get to that. So what are some of the unique characteristics of older people that complicate the detection and management of type 2 diabetes? You did go into some uh, information about this, but if you just wanted to go ahead and, uh, and elaborate. Older people are much slower, and I think 
in in sometimes not always but slower in the way they communicate in the way they uh, use office time but I think what we often misunderstand as clinicians or providers of community services is that they've been to this rodeo before and they're really good at working the system so I'll give you an example of uh, in a recent study uh, uh, in different parts uh, so there were five different regions of the United States um, elders reported how much they lie it's my word not theirs about questions on depression for example uh, diet for example which is very relative to type 2 diabetes because they know what the providers want to hear and sometimes they just want to get on with it and they, they don't want to complicate and get referred for additional medical visits and things like that so it's really important not to just do surface kinds of interactions and interviews, but to really listen, take the time to listen really closely. And, you know, in reality, in a lot of contexts, especially in a the 12 minute interview, medical interview, one just doesn't have time to give an elder the amount of attention that they want. Thank you. And um, a follow up, uh, what are there some approaches that providers can take to improve outcomes for older populations with uh, type 2? diabetes just to really listen closely of you know whatever um, what their issues are you know if if the issue is trying to increase exercise if the issue is trying to change diet to really listen but um, in if you have somebody on your hopefully you're working with other people in an inter interdisciplinary context to use behavior change theories because you know there's evidence to demonstrate that they do work uh, and I think that uh, an example is motivational interviewing uh, it's very popular now but the basic tenet is that a little bit of change is better than no change and one has to just really try to uh, tune into what the, the lifestyle issues are for that individual Thank you. And I do welcome you to elaborate or offer any closing remarks um, based on your content uh, at this time. I'm just never take for granted and, you know, uh, how smart older people are. Uh, I, I myself sometimes, if I'm at the airport and I see 12 wheelchairs lined up to get into the plane, I'm like, oh my goodness, we're never going to get out that time. You know, um, there's a real bias that we're uh, unaware of sometimes against older people and how they uh, impinge upon our personal lives, but also our professional lives. And it's, uh, think of them as a, uh, a very vulnerable population. That's it. Thank you, Peter. We really appreciate your time today. And um, we did have one additional question come in for Alex. So before I wrap the q and A, I I just want to um, go back to Alex real quick. Alex, are you there? Okay, and while we wait for Alex, I'll just um, let everybody know that after the session ends, we will be launching a post-webinar uh, survey. It will take a couple minutes. We really appreciate all the feedback that we have gotten so far on our SDOH Academy session. And again, this was the fifth session of a six-part series. Our last series will be on Thursday, June 14th, and we have a great panelist lineup from uh, up some of, of our other national cooperative agreements. But I do want to see if Alex is still there Alex I'll make sure to get that last question over to Alex and we can follow up offline okay great next slide again just to make you all aware we do have our brief survey and that will be launched right after the session and it will also be available in email to participants following this session it will be sent to you about an hour after this along with the slides and the PDF of the um, presentation today and the survey link and our next training again is on Thursday June 14th this is going to be our last training in our series this year we're really looking forward to having our panelists from the National Nurse-Led Care Consortium Corporation for Supportive Housing Health Outreach Partners 
the National Association for Community Health Centers, and we'll just do a wrap up of the content that we've presented to you. Again, all of the sessions on the SDOH Academy have been recorded and will um, be made available for participants that are interested. You can always reach out to me directly if you haven't gotten access to any previous sessions that you wanted to go ahead and dig into, and I just put my email address in the chat box for your reference. And again, I just want to thank all of our panelists today. This was a very engaging session and we learned a lot, so I wanted to thank them again. And I'm looking forward to our last session together. And if you do need access to any of those recordings, please let me know. And next slide. And I just wanted to thank everybody for staying on with us today during the session. We really appreciate your participation and we look forward to joining um, the session again in June. So thank you so much for your time. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.